When any group of people are denied resources, be it education, loans, housing, or assistance in general, they become marginalized and so does their worth. Not only to the world they are forced to live in, but to themselves. As they look themselves in the mirror knowing they have greatness, knowing they are greatness, but no one wants to hear it simply because they are black. It's time to exhale and be motivated. And it's Book House, mm, yeah. Hey everyone, to all of you, Annie's crew, welcome back to The Blue. Annie's Blue Couch. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me today. Happy Sunday and happy Black History Month. I have to tell you this journey of deep diving as I've been calling it has been so enlightening for me. Many of the stories I share are not the happiest because the truth of the matter is that in a country where white supremacy has pretty much been the foundation, when you study the history of anyone not white, you're not gonna likely find the most wonderful stories of joy or love or prosperity. And I think that's why some people from both sides of the coin, by that I mean both white and black, don't necessarily wanna hear about it. And to be honest, being the positive, big, dreaming, God-loving person that I am, it can really be weighty. But in spite of the doom and gloom and seemingly overall sadness, there is a courage and a strength that emerges from each account I share that inspires me to keep diving. And I hope it does for you too. I wanna take a minute to thank everyone who's been watching my content and leaving me comments and hitting the like button and becoming subscribers and sharing. <laughs> I can't believe it's almost, it's almost a year. I've been sharing my heart with you all and I'm already almost at 400 subscribers. Ow. <laughs> no, but truly, I really, really do appreciate each and every one of you more than I can really say. Okay, back to Black History Month. Today, I wanna give a quick peek into the life of an amazing woman I recently learned about. I've been seeing lots of poetry clips and lots of African-American men and women, young people especially, using poetry to share what they've been feeling about how blacks have been treated in America. And well, it's all got me asking this question, who was the first black poet? Do you know the answer? <laughs> okay, let me stop playing. The answer is Phyllis Wheatley. And let me clarify, she was the first African-American poet to be published. In all of my deep dives, I find there are a number of Blacks who were not credited for their greatness, a number of Blacks who committed suicide to avoid being sold, and just so many accounts of death in large numbers where I just have to believe life ended with greatness inside. So I wanna make the clarification that she was the first published, but not necessarily the first black poet ever. And that is not to diminish her impact. I just want to, when I remember, to acknowledge the unspoken of, or the unknown, the dead heroes, either by choice or by abuse, that we will never know their names. Now, let me say the story of Phyllis Wheatley is so extensive and there are so many people who have so much to say about her. I literally had to put a legit timer on my study time for her. Lifeguards had to come rescue me from my deep dive into the life of this brilliant woman. You should definitely do a personal deep dive on her, especially if you're a lover of written art. Now, Phyllis isn't her real name. In case you didn't know this little known fact, Many times when slaves were purchased, everything was stripped from them, including their names. When black people talk about our heritage and our history being stolen, things like this is what we are referring to. The idea that black people were born to be slaves is an idea created by white supremacy and was never God's intent when we graced this planet. But I've digressed. Miss Phyllis Wheatley, a name given to her by her slave owners, was taken from her family and brought on a slave ship to Boston 
Massachusetts with a group of sickly blacks. They were part of the slave trade of 1761. No one knew what was wrong with them, but due to their weakness and smaller physiques, they were considered not as valuable as their frail bodies just could not handle the usual labor required of slaves. Later on, it was found um, that Miss Wheatley had severe chronic asthma. She was bought from the slave market by John Wheatley of Boston, who gave her as a personal servant to his wife, Susanna Wheatley. The name of the ship she was brought to Boston on was called the Phyllis, hence her first name. And it was customary to be given the surname of your owner's family at this time, hence her last name. We know based on the ship records that it was coming from somewhere in West Africa sometime during 1753. So we think she may have been from West Africa born around that time, but we really don't know what her exact place of birth or date of birth is. When the Wheatleys bought her, because she was missing her top teeth, it was guesstimated she was about seven or eight years old because of that. Now it is recorded that the Wheatleys were progressive slave owners and treated her well as a slave. They recognized her intelligence and allowed her to learn to read and write along with their daughters. And I read somewhere she was even fluent in Greek and Latin. They actually would show her skills off to their family and friends and tried very hard to get her work published in America. This was pretty risky during a time when slaves were discouraged from learning to read and write, if not altogether forbidden. They may have been able to avoid punishment for allowing her to read and write because of their status, but when it came to getting her work published in America, that was just not happening. Boston publishers refused to consider the collection for publication. So the Wheatley sent Phyllis with their son to London, where she was received very well. It was kind of a twofold trip because they thought she would also get much better health care for her asthma condition. Her work was actually already in circulation by the time she got there and the publication of her first volume of work was funded by a family friend of the Wheatleys, Selena Hastings. She was the Countess of Huntingdon at the time. This happened in 1773, just about a year after she left America for London. This was truly an accomplishment. She was black, she was a woman, and let's not forget, she was still a slave. Her book of poetry was called Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. The work in this first volume covered inequality and the unfair practice of slavery. And she was not only, she didn't only use poetry and written art to express herself and to fight for slavery, but every chance she got to speak up and speak out, she did. She also recognized that she had an advantage above many blacks to be great because of education. And she really talked a lot about the denying of education actually suffocating the greatness in African-Americans. She used her writing to change the mindsets of those who considered us lesser than human. She understood that there were other black people who if given the same opportunities as she was given, would be just as great and even greater contributors to society. People argued all sorts of things about her writings being too vague or not carrying the weight of the pertinent matters, but ultimately her poetry was a threat to the conventional style of society and her writings were later used to prove that no race was superior to another. Now in 1778, Phyllis was legally emancipated this allowed her to marry John Peters, who was a free black man. He was an entrepreneur if you ever knew one. He owned a bunch of small businesses, including a local grocery store. Slaves dreamed of this kind of freedom, but the way America was set up, arguably is still set up, they really struggled. They were not given the same medical care as whites. Sounds familiar? They were not given the same financial support in their businesses as whites. Sounds familiar? And in their particular case, as the same situation is for many African Americans even today, their low income and poor health care led to the death of two of their infant children. 
Phyllis Wheatley, well, now Phyllis Wheatley Peters, wrote another volume of poetry, but was unable to publish it because she no longer had the financial backing she needed. And the competition from white male writers caused her to lose sales on her existing work as well. Even though some of those same poems were later published in pamphlets and newspapers, she didn't benefit from any of that while she was alive. The money issues got really bad for them. And in 1784, John Peters, Phyllis's husband, was sent to prison for the excessive amount of debt he had. Phyllis had to get a job as a maid to support herself and what was left of her life. But December 5th, 1784, at the age of 31, Phyllis and their third infant child died. Sadly, she died alone, uncared for, and in the hopelessness of extreme poverty. In 1789, five years after she died, this poem was published by a London newspaper. I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast, Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case, and can I then but pray, others may never feel tyrannic sway? Wheatley was not alive to see her poetry make the kind of impact she hoped it would. It was not until long after a period in America's history known as the Great Awakening did the meaning of her work become fully understood and became a huge proponent in fighting the South's views towards slavery and ultimately abolishing slavery. Her story highlights the importance of resources. When any group of people are denied resources, be it education, loans, housing, or assistance in general, they become marginalized and so does their worth. Not only to the world they are forced to live in, but to themselves. As they look themselves in the mirror knowing they have greatness, knowing they are greatness, but no one wants to hear it simply because they are black. They themselves stop wanting to hear it. The trauma in the lives of the marginalized is real. Nothing God can't heal, should you choose to give it to him. And nothing the nation can't heal, should it choose to stop pretending it doesn't exist. Until next time, remember, you are beautiful. You are special. Your smile is amazing. And don't let anyone or anything ever make you feel less than who or what God has designed you to be. Annie's crew, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Bye for now. Annie's Blue Couch.